Hey, how's everybody doing? This is Matt Murphy with C Incorporated. We are doing another one of our safety podcasts. Um, today we have Littler Law Firm with us. We have Chuck, Eric, and Melissa who are going to talk to us a little bit about um, OSHA. What to do when OSHA shows up? Uh, we're going to get to some good, good ideas of how to handle that OSHA inspection. When should a lawyer be involved? Um, you know, we'll, we'll go through sort of the basics there to help take the scare out of what if OSHA shows up, right? A lot of people don't know and don't think about this until it's too late. So we'll let you guys lead off. I don't know who wants to lead it off, but let's go with uh, maybe your top five to 10 tips on how to survive that OSHA inspection. Sure, I'll start it off. Um, hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a shareholder with Littler Mendelssohn and a former OSHA attorney. Uh, I used to work for OSHA in California and I'm joined with my colleagues, Chuck and Eric. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, sort of inspection to do's and don'ts. Um, I'll kick it off and then turn it over to Eric and I'm sure he'll bounce it to Chuck. Um, we all do this work, so we're pretty familiar with, you know, what to say. Um, so I think the most important thing is you have to have a point of contact designated uh, at the facility or at the site, right? You need to have a game plan in place for when OSHA shows up so that when they show up, the person who is the designated point of contact is going to be notified of the presence of OSHA and they can roll out a plan that you have put in place. Um, I mean, I think, you know, once once that's done, you sort of sequester the inspector, identify um, the reason for the inspection, why are they there, what's the scope of the inspection, try to limit it down um, and, you know, make it as, I guess, you know, bite-sized as possible uh, to prevent, you know, any unnecessary liability or gaps. Uh, I don't know, Eric, do you want to add something to that right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing, and when we're talking about, you know, point of contact, is you've got to, you know, plan ahead for these events. I think we see a lot of employers, particularly small employers, they always think this isn't going to happen to them, right? So they're caught flat-footed. So a little pre-planning is helpful, and this will sort of play into how you handle the inspection. You know, you've got your point of contact, which Melissa talked about, limiting the scope. You know, I do want to to sort of touch on that a little bit more. They're only there for a couple of reasons normally, right? They either an employee complained, um, there's been an accident, which you've called in, or you're sort of under some, you know, national emphasis program, the programmed inspection. And so they're sort of like coming in for that reason. You at least want topically why they're there. If you called it in, you should be prepared for them to show up, right? So you need to already identify where it is you're going to take them to the place of the accident. You sort of want to decide how you're going to lead them there so they're not walking through like the busiest section because you know anything they see is fair game right so you just want to be able to establish that route so you know everything can proceed calmly and don't be afraid to push back you know i think people make the mistake of forgetting you know these inspectors whether they're being nice or aggressive i don't want to say it's a shtick but you know they're doing their jobs right so they're using Everything they do is an attempt to get more information. So whether they're trying to be, you know, guys smiley and like weasel their way into seeing more than necessary or they're being really aggressive, it's to the same end. So, you know, you can, it's okay to have your point of contact, take a beat and say, you know, hold on here, you know, why are you here? We're giving you consent to do this and just, you know, taking control of the situation. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chuck. No worries. And I, I would add on to what Eric said. Um, if you're calling it in, if you're reporting an accident, you should be prepared for the investigation. You know, there are times when OSHA, after you call it in, you might have a week or a week and a half or two weeks, maybe before OSHA shows up. You should use that time putting together your plan. As Eric said, anything that an investigator sees when they're at your facility, they can fight you for in addition, in, in addition for whatever their stated purpose is for being there. That's why it's important to, when the investigator shows up, escort them to a room where they're not going to see anything, essentially. When you're taking the investigator to where the accident happened, have that route predetermined so that they're not going to see any potential violation during that walk around. We've had some clients where if, if the accident happened with the machine at the back of the facility, they'll walk the investigator outside the front door all the way around the facility and in the back door, and then they're at the machine. And that's eliminated any possibility of the investigator seeing anything going on within the facility 
while they're taking that route there. It might not be the, be the most direct route, but it's certainly one that puts the client or the employer in the most favorable position uh, during the inspection. That's a great point, Chuck. I think another thing we have to talk about too, though, um, is documents, right? You are required to have certain documents on site um, that OSHA is entitled to obtain basically immediately or within a couple hours of requesting it. Those are going to be your site safety plans, your injury and illness prevention plans for um, locations like California where there's still COVID requirements. It's going to be a COVID plan. Uh, you're going to have to have, you know, if it's a construction site, you're, you know, you're going to have to have your code of safe practices. Everyone's going to have to have their log 300s. So you want to have all that stuff sort of organized and in a place, updated, ready to go in the event OSHA ever shows up, maybe in a nice little binder. So you're not panicking, um, trying to locate this stuff. And I think the last point we could pre probably talk about maybe is interviews. I don't know, Eric, if you wanted to speak to that, sort of the the importance of uh, making sure you're in control of that. Yeah. So, you know, OSHA is going to want to interview your employees. Um, they're going to take the position that they have an absolute right to interview them by themselves. Um, I'll tell you, this varies from jurisdiction. You know, some statutes are written so the right is vested in the employee such that, you know, if they want a manager there or somebody there, um, they're allowed to do that. They're also allowed not to, you know, have their union rep there. They're in sort of control of who's in their interview. So there are a couple of other jurisdictions, you know, Oregon pops to mind where, you know, the right is vested in the um, division itself. Um, to have these interviews private. And so that could get a little stickier. But for the most part, you know, you should be prepared that your employees are going to speak to the OSHA inspector um, by themselves most of the time. What you want to do, though, is, you know, you can get up ahead of it and, you know, you're okay to interview people before and get a sense of what they're going to say. You just want a message that you want them to tell the truth and not to speculate. But you can control the process, right? OSHA is going to want to pull people off work right on site and sort of interrupt all your operations. They're not really allowed to do that. So if people aren't available and cannot safely be pulled away, you know, you're just going to have to offer them um, to come back and you'll schedule interviews during work time on site. That's usually a preference in the conference room. I'm not necessarily like, you know, right where they're working, but, you know, you can control the process. You do not want your management interviews to be interviewed um, by OSHA alone. Um, they Anything they say will be imputed to the company as an admission. So it's important when they want to you know, interview management that your point of contact, who also understands the importance of like deflecting questions asked of them um, until the appropriate time that you know, we will schedule management interviews um, at a later date. Your point of contact just needs to check with management to see if they want counsel present. And, you know, normally OSHA is fine with that. Um, if they push in any regard, it's going to be towards the employees. A few things there, guys. Uh, this is awesome so far. Uh, Eric and, and Chuck, you both mentioned as far as getting OSHA to a sealed room or, or controlling where they are. A lot of clients that we're going to see this are open construction sites, right? So... They are usually checked out ahead of time. The car pulls up across the street, watches. You can kind of tell it's getting ready to be an OSHA inspection, right? <laughs> so how would they handle that without having OSHA walk the entire site? How do they control that access once OSHA gets there? I mean, I think the best thing to do is is uh, to, to sort of meet them at the gate, so to speak, right? If there's a perimeter of some sort on the site, a lot of time you have like a chain link up or something along those lines, depending on how large the site is. Um, if it's a really big site, you're probably going to have all the trailers, construction trailers, office trailers, restrooms and stuff set in one location that usually is closer to the front of the site. So, I mean, technically... OSHA is not allowed to enter your site without obtaining authority, right? So if they come on, um, the idea would be to get them to someone with management or a designated contact immediately. If they walk in further than they should, walk them back to the front, right? Like <laughs> lead them back to the construction trailer and try to try to you know sort of gatekeep, so to speak, um, no pun intended there, and get them in the trailer, get them out of sight. And with you know, and it's true, ocean inspectors. They love starting their photos when they're on the public street, right? Because they're doing the plain view. Technically, you know, if they witness a violation, they are allowed, you know, to 
sort of trigger an inspection. You know, if you see them sort of lurking outside for a while, you know, I, there's not a whole lot you can do. They're on a public street, right? I don't know if I'd, you know, ring the bell and go on a break or anything, but you know, I mean, you can start to get word out that it looks like they're out there and just prepare um, for their, you know, their arrival. Once we get the inspection file, I mean, if it looks like they were sitting out there for two hours, you know, even though without an opening, you know, there is some room to sort of, you know, argue that, you know, that's sort of going beyond the plain view rules, um, you know, when you're just sort of taking advantage of the situation to get evidence without um, an actual opening. But, you know, all you can really do is like, if you notice them, get ready. I, I wouldn't make a huge commotion about it. But you can let your managers know that maybe, you know, take a look and make sure, you know, that everyone's got, you know, everyone's tied off or, you know, something like that. But, you know, if they're on the street, they're going to take the position they can, you know, document whatever they can um, without um, bothering to go through due process. We can push back later. But, you know, to your question, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do um, except just prepare for their imminent arrival. I got you. I know with a lot of clients, um, especially the smaller GCs and whatnot, maybe they won't w want to put a chain link fence up. And one of my arguments is always, if you put that up and you have controlled access and it says you have to check in at the trailer, it allows you to to get them to come to you rather than them start walking around. Is the That's superintendent right. around? Is the superintendent around? And then, you know, oh, by the way, I saw this, this, and this. So. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. One other point. And on that point, if I can jump in, I did have a case once when I was, you know, on the other side with Cal OSHA, where there was an argument as to, you know, it was with regard to regulation, but part of it was like, where is the entrance to the, um, the construction site? And this, you know, ended up having to do with whether or not they needed an elevator. But in terms of that argument, the inspector had come in another entrance that looked like an entrance. So to the extent you want an entrance, make it look like the entrance. Yeah. It's like that's where you want your bulletin boards and that's where you want your check-in. So there's just no like wiggle room that like, well, there's a hole in the fence in the back. You want to feel like this was the entrance and you knew it. So that's a really good point. And one other, before we move on, um, I know in Maryland and, and uh, most of the metropolitan area here in, in this area, once 911's called, it's a good likelihood that OSHA has been contacted by emergency services. So yes, you do need to make that phone call and yes, you do prepare, but I've had OSHA beat the ambulance to the project before. So um, I think to your point, you know, having that idea not being flat footed, as you said, Eric, I think is, is very important to understand. And on that, Matt, I will say I see it over and over again, you know, particularly like you said, it happens in Maryland. It also happens in California. You have an injury and the fire department or the police department have come and it might not even end up being a truly serious injury, but you know, the fire department, and the police department aren't going to bother figuring that out. They just know there is an injury at work. And if you're in a jurisdiction, which requires um, those entities to report to the workplace safety agency, they're going to call it in. So Anytime you've got an ambulance on site or the police, you know, particularly in jurisdictions like California, but you know, you, you should be aware that they may call it in if they're not actually obligated to do so. And they're not going to sit there and go like, well, are they admitted or not? They're just calling it in. Right. So, um, you should be prepared in those circumstances. Great point. Moving into the inspection. So we've got them on site. We've controlled where they're at. We've, we've talked a little bit about interviews, but walking around, what, what should we know? What should we keep in mind um, to be successful again during the inspection itself with regards to um, not only the interviews, but also taking pictures and, and, and recording heights and distances, et cetera? Yeah, I think that this, this is a, a critical part of the inspection when, when the investigator is doing their walk around it is very, very important that you have someone there who is essentially going to what we call mirror the investigator. If the investigator is taking pictures, you should have someone there taking your own pictures. If the investigator is measuring the width of an aisle, pulling out his, his measuring stick for something else, you should have something there where you can measure as well. Um, we also see this sometimes with on a construction site, noise sampling. 
if the investigator is wanting, this might not be at the initial walk around, but if they come back and they want to take um, noise samples, you should be prepared to take your own as well. Essentially, anything the investigator is doing, you should be doing as well. You should also be taking notes. Um, if the investigator seems keenly interested in one area of your facility or your work site, make sure that's known. If the investigator is speaking to people, make sure you're, you're, you're keeping a, a record of, of who they are speaking with. All of that information is going to be critical to what ultimately becomes your defense of, of the citation. Yeah. And as a point, a follow-up to that, Chuck, I think, you know, we have the, you know, you have your designated contact who's going to be the person who takes the inspector around. And then in terms of the mirroring, I think it's good to have another person, right? Because you want someone focused just speaking to the inspector and being proactive, right? You can have the person who's mirroring sort of like as the assistant, right? It's like taking the pictures, taking the measurements, um, um, writing down information, but you want to have the person who's engaging with the inspector really focused on that and paying attention, right? Because it is sort of like deer in the headlights. Um, you know, you weren't expecting them to come, you weren't expecting them to be there, and you really want to try to have presence of mind as much as possible when you're, when you're talking to the OSHA inspector on site. So ha likely have like, you know, two people that walk through with the inspector to do all jobs. And a great point there, Chuck, as far as the noise, if they're taking noise samples, you know, a lot of people go, well, I don't have that device. Well, download Decibel on your, you know, your, your smartphone and then take it over to what unit they're using and see how close you are as far as the readings. And then at least you have something that, that that's close by and you can kind of get a, you know, a, a close by sun because not everybody has all the toys that, you know, the ocean inspector is going to come out with. So, you know, do the best is what we tell people. Do the best you can. Yeah. And if you want to do a side by side, you can push back too, right? If you really have, if they roll out and they're doing like some sort of, you know, exposure sampling, right? And you're really uncomfortable that you're not able to mimic it at the same time, you can ask them to say, hey, we really want to do side by side. Um, is there any way we could put a pin in this part of, of the inspection and schedule another time, maybe in a couple of days where we can have our own tools here so we can conduct side-by-side -side sampling, right? I mean, that's something if, you know, you got to read every situation as it comes, right? You don't want to, you know, like fire up the inspector and get them angry. Um, but if it's something that's a big deal um, and and they're doing intense sampling or something, you can push back a little bit and sort of like, you know, carve out your rights. That's a great point. That's a great point. So as we walk through, we're taking pictures, we're mirroring them. We're getting our list of people. We're doing all that. Now we're coming up to where we're going to have that closing conference, right? Now we're going to be told what they have concerns with. I don't know about every area, but I know that's kind of the trigger word when they say, I was concerned about this or that. People think they're going to tell them, yes, you're getting citations or no, you're getting citations. They don't really understand the process of who sets those citations, who tells you what you're going to get fined for. And how do they find out what your past history is and how that may affect the citation? So can we talk a little bit about the closing conference? Yeah, I, sure. Eric, do you want to take it? Yeah. So, I mean, to your point, Matt, I, it's a recurring theme that, you know, clients come to us and say, well, the inspector said, you know, everything looked good at the closing conference or, you know, no, no, nothing bad here. And they get there, we sort of, you know, upset that then the citations roll out it's the closing conference is just to sort of close out the inspection sort of give you a rough appraisal of what's happened um you know it's not even going to be a defect if the closing conference hasn't occurred <laughs> it's just part of their procedure right and depending on the demeanor of the inspector some inspectors may be very you know on the ball and know what they're going to cite and they will actually tell you the regs they're looking at others you know they may be green they may be a, not used to a construction work site they're going to go back with all their stuff and sit with their manager and come up with the citations right so all you really want to do with the closing you want to take down everything they say certainly you just want to be polite it's not a really time for management to start challenging findings again these will be admissions just take it in and just know that they're going to go back and do their work behind the scenes 
and don't be upset. Well, you can't be upset, but don't be necessarily surprised if they come out with citations either different than what they identified or, um, you know, if they said everything was fine and then you got four seriouses, it's because the photos went back and someone said, you know, oh, well, look at this. I mean, I would say you, it's worthwhile to note that the inspector didn't see anything because at least in terms when, you know, if we're defending the case, we at least then know that the citations were based on someone looking at a photo. And so it gives us an opening maybe to be able to push back at the level of evidence of the actual violation, because certainly the inspector wasn't looking at the machine, for instance, or the equipment didn't have an issue. And so the person who did is just looking at a photograph. So it at least gives us a sense of how we can push back um, in the appeal process. And correct me if I'm wrong, this is the point without pushing back and, and creating a big obstacle, if they're dead in the wrong, like, you know, OSHA people are, are people, right? So we may have an opinion or we may get something and it's absolutely not true what they're thinking. That's kind of the time to introduce that thought process that, hey, per the standard, I believe I'm in compliance here. So could you show me or could you tell me why I'm not in compliance? Because the ticket hasn't been written yet. And I've always been told that that's your last point before the ticket gets written. And then we have to go to the informal and formal process. I mean, you know, people might have different opinions. I always think that's a tricky proposition. Um, anytime you're sort of goaded into making statements that just help them make their case better sometimes, help them find an actual citation that, you know, maybe is more appropriate. I know a lot of places there, people, you know, they want to, people want to tell their stories and they want to be, you know, pushed back against, you know, injustice, right? But, you know, it can cut both ways. So, I mean, if you have a sort of something that's, you know, that you know is 100% correct, you know, I, I certainly not telling people not to speak their truth, but just be aware that like sometimes you can make their cases better. And I know Melissa's aware of like the 1BY process in California you can, they say, you know, let us know why this isn't as serious. And you say all this stuff. And when I was on the other side, those responses were like half my evidence at hearing, right? You <laughs> got to be careful <laughs> in, in that situation. Sometimes it is better just to wait um, until they block themselves in before you push back. Less is more. Less is yeah. more. I like that. And yeah. that also brings up back to the beginning of this whole deal, picking that person to walk with OSHA. I know a lot of the OSHA inspectors said, my favorite person to walk with is your chattiest employee because yeah. they're going to tell me everything. I don't even have to do my job. They'll do it for me. All <laughs> right. So we got to that. And then how long does it take me to get a citation? And what should I do once I receive that citation? Uh, I mean, you know, the statute of limitations really is like, you know, six months. And it usually runs. Um, there's, there's rare instances where the statute is told. Um, but that's really only if the employer is like a bad actor and hiding evidence or like hiding a an accident and fail to report actively, right? Um, it's not often that the statute is told. Um, so it's usually six months from the the instance or, or the accident, right? Um, a lot of people get frustrated with how slowly the process moves. So we have a lot of clients that are like, what's happening? I need an update, right? I need a status. And we're like, whoa, this is just, you know, we're on a different, you know, <laughs> we're on a different time track here. You just get cool your jets, right? So we just sort of have to, you know, after there's this big flurry in the beginning, right? You have the inspection and interviews and all these things. And then, and then you're just waiting for OSHA to decide what they're going to do. Um, during that time, like you said, you can have the informal. Um, uh, but other than that, you just kind of chill until you get the citation, right? And then at that point in time, once you receive them, you take a look at them and you decide. Uh, do you want to have like an informal, um, you know, under Fed OSHA, an informal discussion with the area office before they go, you know, you go ahead and file the contest and then it's kicked over to a DOL attorney. I mean, you make the assessment at that time, but we often tell people like, let's just wait and see what comes out, right? See what shakes out in the wash. Um, Chuck and I just had an inspection recently in Virginia where it was like, it was intense. There was a lot going on. And we were, you know, at the end of it, we were shocked. We didn't get a single citation, the client to get a single citation. And, and, you know, sometimes you, you think, you know, what's going on and, and the end result is completely different than what you anticipated. 
Um, so I, I would say, we always say to clients, like, let's see what's going on, right? We got to talk about abatement. There's that period too um, that comes up after that. I don't know, you know, Chuck or Eric, if you want to dip into that or Matt, you want to talk about something else, but that's kind of a key point too. No, that's fine. Yeah. Let's talk about what, what to do next with the abatement, maybe some good follow-up procedures. Well, one point that I just wanted to um, jump in on going back a second now, you had mentioned, um, or Eric had mentioned that, you know, a lot of our clients, they want their time to, to speak their truth. And it might not be during the closing conference, but the opportunity that they're going to have that stand to tell OSHA why they think these citations are incorrect, that's going to be during the informal conference. Um, Melissa mentioned in Fed OSHA, the informal conference, you can schedule that any time. You have 15 working days after you receive that citation to schedule that informal conference. We have a lot of clients, that's when they bring in lawyers after they get those citations. So that's kind of our period um, to get up to speed, find out what happened, put together our defense. And when you go into that informal conference with OSHA, you know, think of that as almost your one shot to present your case to OSHA. After that, as Melissa mentioned, it gets kicked over to an attorney. Attorneys can either be far more reasonable to work with or much more difficult. You really don't know which way it's going to go. So when you approach that informal, that is that would be your chance as an employer that I would say that that's your time to shine, that's your time to say what you want to say, that's your piece. Um, bring evidence that you want to show with you. There are times that we've, we've had citations issued to clients based on what the inspector perceived was a lack of a process. They, they, they thought our client didn't have X, Y, Z in place, but in our opinion, it was because the inspector never asked our client to produce evidence of X, Y, Z process. So when we went to the informal, we had everything ready to go. We presented it to the area director and they withdrew the citations at the informal. Um, but I would just say that the informal conference, that can really be your your one chance as a as an employer to speak what you want to say to OSHA. And I think that's a great point. I would say, you know, I've been doing this 25 years now, maybe a little more. And, you know, that really changed. 25 years ago, you went and you had a conversation with the area director and it was probably going to get changed. And now, unless you do not... Um, sorry, unless you do not get, you know, what you want, then you go to a formal and then you have, again, a lawyer speaking to a lawyer. Nowadays, I, I find it much better for my clients to get that lawyer involved in the informal, you know, they'll call me and want me to do it. And I'm like, really, when you have the lawyer presented a certain way, yes, you're spending a little bit more, but I think it's time well spent because, you know, they, they understand the differences that maybe a safety consultant or a safety director may not. So I think that's a great idea or a great point there, Chuck. Hey, my own man. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Do we have to switch, <laughs> Caroline? I actually fixed it so you guys can just talk as long as you want. Okay, cool. I saw that. I was like, it's counting down. I just saw a big <laughs> bubble pop up in front. I know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you guys are good. Talk away. Perfect. Yeah. Eric, do you want to talk? Were you going to talk about abatement? Yeah, I was going to talk about some, you know, just a post appeal things. And Chuck's very correct about the whole informal process. Going back to the closing conference, one thing everyone needs to do the one thing you need to do is make clear where the citations are being mailed to and yeah. whose attention they're being mailed. You don't want to hang up without having that conversation <laughs> and making that completely clear. And you, know, and you want to make sure that it's also clear that if they are going to email you a courtesy copy, that your appeal date is off the certified letter. Like you just, that's one thing you want to be, they say, do you have any comments or questions? <laughs> you know, where are you sending it? How is it being sent? And who is it going to be, as attention is it coming to? We had, too many cases where things just go somewhere and then sit and then we're in a late appeal situation. And that person has to know that when this thing arrives, you know, your deadlines start, right? Yep. So you don't want to miss the opportunity, you know, the appeal deadline. You can have your informal conference before in some jurisdictions. Some you end up having it afterwards on the state plan side. 
but don't miss your appeal deadline. On your citation, that's also going to say the date that abatement is due. Now, it varies by jurisdiction what the effect of, you know, your appeal is, right? Sometimes it just stays abatement. Sometimes in some states it's double dual tracked, so you have to abate even if you're contesting. You know, Washington and Oregon are like that. In others like California, you're on an expedited process. So you want to, like, you know, know what that rule is where you're at. Across the board, though, if you're going to an informal conference, no one is settling unless you've abated. So practically speaking, if the items are, if the hazards are addressable, even if you have issues with the citations, you know, if you want an, easy, an easier shot at negotiating, you're going to want to abate. But you have to be careful, though, because you don't want to be caught in situations where you're told you were supposed to abate and you didn't, and then they come in on reinspections and issue failure to abate. And unfortunately, this can all vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And then on top of it, different area offices are going to have different sort of you know, levels of aggression in terms of submitting abatement. So, but that is a second date you have to be aware of. And whether it's after the final order of hearing, which, you know, is easier, it gives you a lot more time to think about it, but it, the date will come, or in trying to get a settlement, you know, you have to think about how are you going to fix and resolve the alleged hazards. OSHA can't tell you how to do it, um, but they can certainly, you know, they need the sign off, right? So they do exert pressure, even if they're not directly saying you have to do why. But those are really the two sort of things you have to keep an eye on um, when you get your citations. If you can't meet the stated deadline and you're not in a jurisdiction where the uh, abatement is stayed, you need to, you know, reach out to your office and say, I need more time. They'll want to know what you've done, but it's often better to, like, get them to agree to push out the deadline than to completely blow it. Yeah. Well said. Very well said. Yeah. Same way we want to talk about multi-employer citations. We see oh. a lot of construction. No. No. I'm trying to get <laughs> those right now. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Back to our favorite topic, multi-employer worksite citations. Oh, boy. We're, uh, you know, <laughs> talking about this a lot lately yeah. with one client in particular. Um, you know, Big construction client, uh, you know, multi, you know, I'll let Chuck and Eric speak to this as well, but, you know, the difficulty with multi-employer citations and inspections is always, you know, who's in charge, right? And there's that fine line uh, when you have the GCs and subs of trades on site and it gets even stickier when you have a construction manager involved, um, you know, you, you need to make sure you're doing enough as the GC but you want, don't want to do so much that you suddenly, you know, have control over the subcontractor's employees, right? So it's this balance between making sure you're doing it enough and everybody's safe and not taking over complete control and requiring and allowing the subs to be in control of their own employees and, and, and requiring them to have to, you know, step up and do what they're supposed to do, right? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's sticky any way you cut it. I don't know, it, you know, Chuck or Eric, if you guys have any thoughts on it. I mean, it's, we could talk about this, you know, for 10 hours, Matt. Yeah, we could do a whole thing on this. We could do a whole know, cat series on this. Even though <laughs> the next one we do is just all about multi-employer. I mean, I guess I'll just say it was an enforcement policy that came out of OSHA originally in construction. Um, some state plans have actually put it in the statute and regulation. You know, as Melissa said, it's, you know, I mean, there's four categories, right? So, you know, it's exposing, creating, correcting, and controlling. And it really is just a way, you know, not to sound cynical, but, you know, it spreads liability around, right? So maybe it's not your job to put up a guardrail because it's not your trade, but OSHA, you know, from the parking lot that you mentioned, Matt, is taking pictures and sees your employee too close to the edge, you know, you're now the exposing employer, right? So you get nabbed. Um, the employee who 
didn't put up the guardrail, even though that wasn't, that was your employee and not theirs, right? They're the creating um, employer. So they get nabbed, you know, and maybe they were correcting to or not. That's who fixes it. And then the GC's around and, you know, they're potentially the controlling employer. And there's just not a lot of guidance as to how you can stay in your lane. I mean, exposing is fairly easy, right? It's our employees, yeah. but the rest of them, there's no necessary requirement for an employee employee relationship with um you know the people that are exposed so there's not a lot of guidance into what lane to stand and as melissa's talking about you know the more you do the more you know either if you're doing not enough and then you get nabbed or you do too much and you get nabbed it's 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 difficult and it's challenging and especially on the controlling side you know and there's just not a lot of you know I can't, I can't advise you on a safe harbor of like what level's just enough, um, particularly in OSHA where it's an enforcement policy. You know, maybe we have a little more guidance like in California, you know, because there's actually been decisions on the regulation. But, you know, it, it's amorphous and it, it literally is, it's a net. <laughs> and, you know, and it, yeah, that that's, yeah. I don't know if actually has anything to add. I would say but one thing, one, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chuck. One thing that, that we have seen is it, there is a the multi-employer doctrine is out there. There are certain elements that OSHA has listed in there, but from our perspective, it feels like it's not consistently applied across jurisdictions. Um, so it is really difficult, as as Eric was saying, to to advise our clients on this. A lot of times, as the controlling employer, general contractors don't know what they can do to satisfy the multi-employer doctrine in terms of oversight uh, amongst the construction site. If they don't do enough, they're going to be cited as the controlling employer. If they do too much, there's a concern that they are actually exerting too much control over a subcontractor's employer and might be considered a, a joint employer under a different legal theory. So there's a lot of times we feel like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place with no clear way to advise our clients on, as Eric mentioned, a safe harbor. You know, you know exactly what you need to do, so you're going to be uh, in the clear. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I think you can do that we tell clients is, you know, you gotta have your programs in place, right? And that goes for the GC and the subs. So the GC has to do their due diligence. They have to make sure when they're hiring the trades and the subs that those companies have safety programs in place and they're doing their JHAs and, you know, there's, you know, the walkthrough and sort of like the, you know, the scheduling, the work schedule, and, and you got to control the things you can control, right? So you got to have your ducks in a row in, in the sense of your documents. And as much as you can sort of clearly assign the duties, right? And, and and sort of delegate those duties to um, the subcontractors, making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, it's going to be better for you, right? Because at the end of it, you can say, listen, man, when we started this, we went through all of this. Here's the plan. Here's the schedule. We know what trades are where on what day. They're doing their JHAs and their walkthroughs. We're doing site checks at this time. They know from after our site check in the morning until the end of the day, it's on them because they're the only one in that zone, right? So, I mean, there are things that you can do to try to, you know, quote unquote, keep your side of the street clean. And I think documentation and laying out duties and responsibilities at the outside of the project and having, you know, the, the, the subcontractors making sure that the subs that you're using have safety plans and they're enforcing their safety rules with their employees to the extent possible that you can do that. I know you can't control this stuff. But those are a couple things that you can, you can try to do, right? And in that regard, I will say, if you're a general contractor, if, you know, given the NEP with OSHA, like heat is your problem. You need to make sure that water is on site and shade is on site. Um, they always right. turn to the general contractor for that. Um, I see you're hearing this first now. I just heard that, you know, Cal OSHA plans to double heat inspections this summer. Um, and I think a lot of it is because they're collecting data for their indoor heat. Um, 
So they're going inside and out. So they will be out in force. That's their plan. So general contractors always get nabbed for that. And if you want other low hanging fruit, <laughs> make sure, you know, you're not going to get out of a scaffolding citation um, if the scaffolding's bad because it's in plain view. General contractors get nabbed on rebar, uncapped all the time. So it's it's all ties into Melissa's sort of like that morning inspection, the stuff you would see there, you got to fix. Yeah. Um, or tell your subs to fix. But heat, heat, heat. Like you, I don't see any agency letting a GC off um, because there's no water and shade on site. I got you. Just a couple more questions and we'll wrap this session up. Uh, what are some documents that you might push back on when OSHA asks you for them? You know, there's an accident, there's, or they're, you know, they're just doing an inspection. What are some things you might hold back and say, you know what, let's, uh, let's run this past our lawyer. I mean, there's always going to be the scope, right? If you, if you get some some gunner, like go-getter inspector who's asking for, you know, beyond a year of training records, um, like if they're like five years of training records for every employee on site, I mean, that's something where you're like, okay, like, let's just, you know, feather the brakes for a moment, homie. Like there were two people involved in this. <laughs> like, Let's like whittle it down to the people that are involved or relevant folks or just you know the people that actually perform the same task right and then we'll give you you know you know the training records for x amount of time but we're not going to give you the history of the universe of documents at this company right i mean chuck do you have any thoughts on that i know you've been dealing with a lot of this pushback stuff lately with the case you're on no i agree and i think another point that i would raise in terms of documents there may be times when OSHA is asking you for documents that you might not have. And instead of going back to OSHA and saying, hey, you know, we don't have this, think of other ways you can cobble together other information um, that can essentially satisfy what the inspector is looking for. You know, sometimes they ask you for formal training documents about some process, but a lot of the times the training, um, it's done in person, it's done on the fly. It, it might not be the greatest solution, but if you can put that information forward instead of saying, hey, we just don't have these, that might be what OSHA is looking for. That might be enough to satisfy them. And it's better than nothing, right? We've used toolbox talks before, right? You know, they, yep. you know, we don't have formal training on this, but this employee, they just started three months ago. What was your toolbox talks for the last three months? And they look at yep. it, Well, that topic was covered twice. Why don't you send those in? And OSHA's happy with it. They're like, okay, you, you've done your deal. So yep. very important. And other things we sort of push back on, generally speaking, um, normally, at least at the first pass, you know, normally don't provide everyone's contact information. Usually say, you know, we'll schedule the interviews on site so you can control it. And at that point, the employee wants to disclose their phone number, you know, they're free to do so. Um, I personally normally push back on pay stubs. Um, you know, I'll, we'll just admit employment of the employee. I don't know that, you know, necessarily all that has to go out. And I do want to touch upon accident investigations, right? So, you know, part of, you know, being a safe employer, you're going to, you know, conduct an investigation and document, you know, any corrective action. Those documents can be problematic sometimes in um, the context of an OSHA inspection. So you need to sort of balance, you know, having some sort of just straight factual narrative um, that shows that you're sort of engaged in the process, but you don't have to have it done by the third day after the accident when they ask for it, right? So we tend to, you know, avoid sort of providing like, you know, particularly in a, you know, obviously if something's super complicated, you want to be safe, right? But, you know, handing over some detailed root cause analysis while some, why somebody fell down the stairs is that sometimes it's just going to get you it could get you into, you know, more trouble for no reason when you're just doing the right thing. So we do take a hard look at sort of those records to determine what the appropriate response is. You do want to be engaged in that, you know, activity. It's part of being a good employer, what we all want to do. But, you know, we do sort of tread lightly on what we're providing, um, particularly at the beginning when, you know, you don't know what happened either, right? We're all collecting info. There's no reason for you to be feel forced to like, you know, document a conclusion when, you know, OSHA hasn't even figured it out yet. So uh, that's just something to be cautious about, not necessarily withhold, but I just want to flag that as something to be mindful of. No, Eric, that's great. I really appreciate that. 
Chuck, I got a question for you. Why should I use a OSHA or a uh, labor lawyer rather than my brother-in-law's dog groomer's friend's <laughs> best friend's divorce lawyer? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, I think as workplace safety lawyers, this is what we do every day. We are very specialized in this area. A lot of times our, our purpose, it's not to be reactive to an inspection. It's to understand and predict where they are going to go, where our client's gaps are going to be and how we can help address those gaps before OSHA discovers them, finds them to put our client in the best possible, um, best possible outcome, give them the best possible outcome. Um, there's a lot of other things that we can add during or even before an inspection. We have some clients that will contact us as soon as the serious accident happened. OSHA may not have shown up, may not have already shown up to the work site yet. We can use that period of time to help put together this plan that we talked about earlier. Um, during the inspection, when they want to talk to employees, you can use your workplace safety lawyers to help prepare those employees. Um, you know, go through mock interviews, help them understand what kind of questions are being asked, help them understand the gravity of the situation. If they're a management employee, what they say is going to be said on behalf of the company. Um, when it comes to negotiating with OSHA, we can add a lot of value understanding the different, you know, the different levers that can be pulled. Obviously, in, in every situation, we would love to have the citation withdrawn. That's just not possible sometimes. But when we get to understand our client what they're looking for, maybe they're only looking for a reduction in the penalty. Maybe they're looking for a change in the classification. Maybe there's a different standard that should have been cited instead of the one that's with from a citation. And as we'll play safety lawyers who do this type of stuff every single day, that's where we can negotiate with OSHA and get those outcomes that either our client may not even had on their radar. They might just think, okay, let's just pay this penalty and go on. Um, I, I think those are certainly some areas where it makes sense to bring in the, the specialized workplace safety attorneys. I'm sure Melissa and Eric have other ideas as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, it's one of those things like we are hyper specialized and I always tell people I stay in my lane, right? I'm not a generalist. You know, when clients come to us, you know, of course we work at a law firm that is, you know, me comprised of specialists, right? So, you know, if somebody comes to me with a traditional labor question, I know, you know, enough about traditional labor to be dangerous. I have to deal with it with certain clients that I work with, you know, workplace safety on because they're unionized, but I set it along, right? It's just, I send it along to the appropriate person who can handle it. I mean, we day in and day out, um, you know, we're talking to government uh, attorneys. We're talking to the inspectors. We're talking to the co-shows. I mean, that is something that, you know, it becomes a skill, right? Like that's one of the reasons we're valuable with what we do. Um, and then, you know, for those of us who have been on the other side, you do understand the way these places operate. You under, understand the way OSHA thinks and and oftentimes why they're doing certain things that they're doing, right? Uh, more so than somebody who's not a specialist. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I mean, as an attorney who does this, of course, I'm going to say you need to hire a specialist, hire us, try right? We're the best. <laughs> But it really is something that, you know, Eric and I talk about this every day. You know, we have a lot of the younger associates that are inter interested in safety and health. And they're like, oh, I don't want to litigate. I don't want to do the appeals. I want to do the advice and counsel. Well, you can't do the advice and counsel until you've done the litigation and you've done the appeals day in and day out for years and years and years and years. Because that's how you learn the issues, right? I mean, this stuff is very nuanced. And I'm never going to say that, like, you know, I'm an expert on confined spaces or I'm an expert on high voltage. No, we're not the experts. We're the expert attorneys. We're the safety attorneys, right? But we're always going to use the people like you, Matt, right? That are the safety consultants that really are the experts in these certain areas. But we truly are the experts on the legal issues in the safety arena. So we are able to see things simply because of our experience that other people cannot. Um, so that'd be my pitch. I don't know. <laughs> 
I couldn't agree with you guys more. And another thing is, you know, what I tell people all the time is I can't tell you how many times a client will be like, you know, they, they charge me for two days worth of reading standards. And I'm like, well, that's the difference. The, the OSHA lawyer or the labor lawyer or whatever, whoever's going to go to it, if it's their specialty, they have probably already read that, read that standard. Right. And not only that, they already understand it. And they may have been the ones that lobbied against it or for it back in the day. So you're getting more of that familiarity with what what is done right what what's in the construction what's behind that citation etc yeah and at the end of the day i mean you're dealing with the government enforcement agency right so i think as melissa said you know you guys are the safety specialists and employers have technical specialists but you know we've all been like pulled over before right like i we all get nervous and we start talking too much and we get fidgety and we sort of like you know don't know what to do and don't organize their thoughts well. So sometimes a lot of the things we just do, sometimes I don't even appear during the inspection. I'm just on the phone guiding from behind if the employer, you know, if that's how they want to roll. It, you know, sometimes it's just having somebody there that you know can intervene if things go south, you know, and that, you know, our most sophisticated clients at some point end up calling us because like, you know, things start to get a little weird or it's a situation they've never been in. And I think, you know, I think sometimes it's just, it's when you're in an enforcement context, you know, it just makes sense sometimes to have, you know, legal counsel at least available to help guide you. Um, Cause at the end of the day, I mean, you, you know, you could end up with a citation and monetary penalties and, you know, certain situations perhaps worse. So it's, you know, it, it's important to, at least I know you have someone available sometimes, you know, and you don't necessarily need us on the front line, you know, from beginning to end. But, you know, there's a lot of clients that just like knowing they can call me and ask my opinion on like, well, do we produce this document or not? Right. So there's different levels of involvement we can be in. Well, that brings me to the last question, which is exactly that. When do we involve you guys? When do we involve a, a lawyer? Chuck, you want to take that? I mean, the short answer is as soon as possible, but. <laughs> and I will say we get brought in at all different, all different phases. Some clients bring us in as soon as the accident happens. Some clients during the uh, inspection, if they feel things are starting to get um, a little more amplified than they had thought it would be, you know, when interviews start happening, they might get a little unco- uncomfortable and they want lawyers brought in. Some clients wait until the citations are issued. I will say the earlier we are brought in, it makes our job that much easier. Um, if you wait until citations are issued to bring in counsel, that's usually in preparation for the informal conference. We don't under in Fed OSHA, we don't have a copy of OSHA's file before that informal conference. So we are trying to go back and if our client has kept good records and kept good notes and kept their photographs, analyzing all that information to figure out not only where the gaps in their processes might have been, but where the gaps in OSHA citations might be as well. Um, if we're involved from the beginning, it gives us much more control of that process. So as Melissa said, as early as possible is always best, but we know not all clients prefer that. Um, we can be brought in really at any time though. Perfect. I, I will add to that if, if you know, if there's a fatality or a serious injury or some type of catastrophe, you know, I, if we're not the first people you call, um, certainly should be the second after you've reported it to OSHA. <laughs> um, though those are the one instances where, where I always tell people, you know, you, it, it's your benefit to get somebody legal involved immediately, um, in those situations who can hopefully start their work before Yosha's even showed up. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that in the next session when we talk about uh, accidents and, and when to involve you all as well. Well, I want to thank Littler Law Firm, you know, Chuck, Eric, Melissa. I think this has been a great podcast. I'm new to this stuff, so we're getting it out there. We're going to get it on our website. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate you all being involved in this. And, again, can't wait to work with you all in the future. And we've worked with littler for good while now good while so a lot of our clients uh, know you guys and and are very happy to work with you so really appreciate your time and uh we will talk soon and we'll have another podcast here very shortly thanks for having us matt thanks for having me good
Yeah. Uh, thank you.